democracy. I thank you, dear Lord, that we're able to assemble today. And I thank you, dear Lord, that we're able to talk to you through the vehicle that is labeled prayer. We know, dear Heavenly Father, that you speak to us through your word. We know that you speak to us through psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But Lord, sharpen our tools that we will be able to draw, be drawn more clearly and more dearly to you so that we may know thy will. Because we want our ways to please you. For you said in the word that if a man's or person's ways pleases the Lord, he will make even our enemies to be at peace with us. So teach us, Lord, what to do, how to do, and give us a praying spirit and a praying attitude, and we'll bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so in um, Matthew chapter 6, which is the derivative of which is the baseline of where I'm going in just a few moments, the disciples have been watching Jesus do some very intriguing things. They watched him heal individuals. They watched him revolutionize situations, and uh, they, they watched the Lord deal with critical matters of hatred, jealousy, uh, envy, uh, the uh, cares of this life, the cares of things that were happening. And sometimes in our life, there are both high points and there are low points. And then there are those points that are kind of even keel where we're kind of managing. I want to say this to you, and it's often said, that if you're not in a storm, you just came from a storm, or you're on your way to a storm. And so in order to be successful, you have to have the tools and the resources to be effective. How are we effective? Some of the things that uh, hinder our ability to be effective is that we're holding on to things. We're holding on to hurts, we're holding on to pain, we're holding on to disappointment. We're holding on to unforgiveness. Let's say it like this, and let's just be transparent. A lot of things in our life we just didn't deserve. I don't care when you get done with it, no matter what anyone says to you, when you get done with it and you calculate it all, it could have been a different way. Some of these things that happen are things that God allowed to happen for his glory to be revealed. Some of the things that happened in our life happened because we made poor choices. Some of the things that happened in our life is because the enemy chose to attack us. Now, everything that happens to us that's bad is not the devil that did it. Some things we did ourselves. Uh, we've given him some credit that he didn't deserve. We, we, we're putting money in his bank that, that, uh, that he doesn't actually deserve or invest in because he took advantage of what happened, but he wasn't the culprit behind it. It was our choice. The Bible allows us to know that we get carried away with our thoughts, and if we don't bring every thought to the obedience of Christ, then we open ourselves to a lot of things. Some things we could avoid if we would just say no and stand on it. Many times we don't want to stand on it because it's convenient, and whether we like it or not, Sometimes we like our little pet demons. <laughs> Sometimes until the Lord delivers us. They're familiar. We're used to it. It's something that we've been doing a long time. And then we get saved. And the process of after getting saved, we must sanctify ourselves, which is to set ourselves apart. So we must learn how to make right choices and so what is said before us, now this is the Bible, I didn't write it. Uh, he says he puts before us both good and evil. Before us is right and wrong. But we must choose, and even one scripture says, we must choose ye this day whom we will serve. So we make some choices, all right? And when we make those choices, um, Mother Daniels used to say, if you're not careful, you'll wallow in sorrow's valley. Uh, that's, that's what she used to say, wallow in sorrow's valley. So, in other words, the devil comes but to kill, steal, and destroy. And he comes to, uh, he uses the word distraction. And as long as you're all focused and you're doing well, 
Uh, it upsets the enemy, so he wants to distract you. How does he distract you? He can distract you using people. He can distract you using things. He can distract you using your situations. But what you must understand is that you have a divine purpose and calling on your life. And the reason you are under attack when you're under attack is because the enemy sometimes sees things in you that you don't see in yourself. All right? So the, the best way to stop them and get them upset so they won't go to church tonight is to get them mad about something. Let them lose something. Let somebody say something. Let someone do something. Let something happen. Let them get a, a phone call that disrupts them. Uh, distractions. And distractions, uh, really, uh, if you think about it, would almost be similar to an attraction. But the difference between uh, an attraction and a distraction is whenever you see dis, it's going to separate or disconnect. Okay? So, all right. Disagree. Boom. All right. Whenever you see that dis, you always kind of look <clears throat> at what's before it, the preface and the suffix. You look at the, but try to find the root to find out what is really going on. So the Lord is drawing you. And while the Lord is drawing you, the Lord does not speak harshly most of the time. You know, sometimes he does. He has to get our attention. Sometimes the Lord will just say, no. I know there was uh, 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 an example, uh, and, I, and I guess if I give a personal example, it'll help. Uh, when I had served as pastor in uh, Atlanta, as well as serving here, and I was getting an enormous pressure from the church down in Atlanta, Bishop Owens, the church where he pastored, a greater community, a wonderful group of people, fantastic folk. And if you remember, even some of their trustees came up to the church uh, for the sole purpose to persuade me and to persuade you all for me to leave Holy Redeemer and go down to Atlanta. And, and you, that's what you all shouted in service when the, the man should have never got up in church and said, I came up here to snatch your pastor from you. I remember some of you all, it took a little, some of you all to cool off uh, a good little while you had to pray. But nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, the Lord spoke to me boldly, clearly, precisely, and said to me just one word, no. It was a resounding no. <clears throat> my grandfather's church, First Baptist Church, West End, seven times I was offered to pastor that church. I had great affinity to that church because that's where I grew up. I knew the people there. I loved the people there, still do to this day. I loved my grandfather, his profound preaching, his, the, his whole mannerism, every, uh, everything he did. He was a barber and, uh, and, and, and would run revivals throughout Alabama. And, and uh, he would take me and my younger brother, we'd be in that old galaxy Ford, and he'd be running throughout uh, all these small towns in Alabama, run, preaching, preaching hard. My grandmother would send us with him so because she knew how hard he would preach so that when he was driving back home in those days at night in the south on those two-lane roads that, uh, one, someone would be with him because there were a lot of other kind of things that happened in the south in that season and still do in the north and south as well but also to keep him woke. And she told us, talk to him, sing to him, keep him woke, ask him questions about his sermon. Uh, my grandmother was a wise woman, which means that she was also telling us to listen to his sermon so we would know the questions to ask. And uh, when it looked, granddad could go to sleep and still be driving. And many times the way you know is he started snoring. And so my brother Reggie would nudge me 
And, you know, because for whatever reason, Papa, you know, he loved to, to answer my questions. I don't know. He just loved to answer my question. So I would ask him about scripture. And it was my job to keep him woke. And she, that we'd keep him woke until we got to where there, there were street lights um, in Birmingham. And then granddad would come. He'd be so exhausted, so tired, get up early in the morning, uh, go cutting hair, go visiting, doing all the rest. And part of that whole perception was that it was distractions. Uh, and even when my grandfather, the Lord called him home uh, to be with him, uh, he, had, he was in Baptist Hospital down in Birmingham, and uh, he was having heart issues. And they had told him, they said, well, Reverend, you need to take it easy. You need to do this. You need to do the other. Uh, Granddad had made an appointment. He was teaching at the Baptist College, and he made an appointment. And my grandmother said to him, General, she said, baby, why don't you stay home and, and let your body heal? So you just got out the hospital, let your, let, let your body heal. He was a Nezzy. Uh, th those preachers are dependent on me. Um, they're looking for, and indeed they were. And granddad went to the uh, Baptist college and he preached and he showed them how to preach. And my grandfather was a profound and prolific preacher. And I mean, his movements, his tone, his texture, his voice, you know, it was like thunder. They used to call it there because the church was like low. They called it the foot. And uh, even the centers in the neighborhood, uh, they would, you know, they would open up the windows down in the south so they could hear Rev holler and scream, you know, because he had that, whoa, you know, all of that. And, and I mean, the, the, even when Granddaddy was preaching, the, the folk drinking would put their bottle down while they was preaching outside the church uh, just to hear the sermon. And then after Granddaddy finished, then they picked it back up again. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, the uh, distraction, he went there. And after he had gone there, he preached, he showed him, sat in the chair uh, behind him and, and lowered his head like this. And the Lord had called him home that quickly. It was very peaceful. And it was the way he would have wanted to transition. And he had told her and told his other preacher friend, told my grandmother and other preacher friend, if the Lord call, when the Lord calls me home, I want him to call me while I'm on duty. I mean, they were just committed soldiers. Granddaddy had a prayer life, and Granddaddy had a life where he would study the word. He had a big, like, two or three hundred watt bulb, and uh, you know, one light in the room, and his Bible and his glasses, and he would read the word, and he would say to me, Shadrach, uh, yes, sir. Love the church. I said, yes, sir, Papa. Shadrach, yes, sir, Papa. I can hear it. Just like right now. Love the church. He says several times, several times, several times, Shadrach. Now, my name is not Shadrach. But my granddaddy was six foot something, and my name was Shadrach. I saw him whoop my uncles. My name was Shadrach. <laughs> okay? And then after he said, love the church, Shadrach. Yes, sir, Papa. Love the people. Yes, yes, sir. Don't matter what they say. Don't matter what they do. You love the people. Yes, sir. Papa. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Papa. Do you hear what I'm saying? Love God. Love the people. Yes, sir. Have a prayer life. Yes, sir. Nothing takes the place of study. Yes, sir. You keep going in that word till you get what God have for you. I said, I said, yes, yes, sir, Papa. Yes, sir, Papa. I wasn't, a, I wasn't a preacher. Why he telling me to get in the word and do all of this, what he, you know, <clears throat> and live right. Yes, sir. Live right. Let them follow you anywhere. No matter what they say. But let them see Jesus in you. Yes, yes sir, Papa. Can I go play? <laughs> <laughs> and so he instilled that in me. My mother instilled that in me, prayer. My grandmother instilled that in me, prayer. My father did not. My father instilled business acumen. He worked hard and, 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 and provide. And, 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 and a true Daniel done beg and done borrow. You know, you know, he was an old southern man, you know, that, 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 you know, he didn't take a lot of stuff. You know, he didn't bother you but didn't want you to bother his wife or his children. And so 
as, as, we, as, as Jesus begins to talk to his disciples, they're observing him like I observed my grandfather. And they learned something about him, and that was when Jesus was successful, which was everything he did, he prayed. So they got to a point, how, how, how many times have you ever tried something and it didn't work? And you just had to realize what I'm doing, the way I'm doing it, it just is not working. I need a better method. I need a better formula. So they said to him, teach us how to pray. And that's what I'm going to talk about now just for a minute. Um, <clears throat> uh, but he says something before that. So you're going to go to uh, uh, Matthew 6 and start at 5, uh, Brother Elder. Uh, I told you, you watch and you observe. A lot of things that I do now in terms of even preparing food is because I observe to do it. But some things you only learn by trial and error. No matter how many times I saw my grandmother make that, those yeast rolls that would just float and soak and all the rest of it, I can try the same thing. But because I took for granted, I took for granted that grandmother would always be here, I didn't learn all of the things that I should have learned. The disciples took for granted that Jesus would always be here. And many of the tools that they could have learned and many of the lessons that they could have avoided, they did not because they didn't take advantage of the path, the person that was creating the path. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't understand the totality of understanding suffering. They didn't want to suffer, just like us. We don't want to suffer. We complain. We grumble. Children of Israel, that was the problem. The journey that they took from uh, bondage, Egypt, to the promised land was a 40-day journey. That's all it was supposed to take them was 40 days. But because of their rebellious, because rebelliousness, and because of their unwillingness to listen, their stubbornness, their uh, creating idol gods, it took them 40 years. Isn't it amazing that something that you could do in 40 days, they could have captured the promised land, the walls could have come down in 40 days, but because they wanted to do it their own way. Some people will not listen. They don't believe that fat meat is greasy. Some people will not listen. And so what God does is he's patient. And I thank God for his patience. He doesn't deal with us always from where we are. And so must we. Everybody, you've got to be, you, you, you've got to go that extra mile of the way. Some people feel entitled and that they're this, that, and the other. But whatever we are, we are because of God. And whatever it is that we do, we do because of God. And if we can help somebody else while we journey this path, we have an obligation and a responsibility to take time <clears throat> for somebody else because somebody took time for us. Amen. I made reference to my grandfather. You have your own point of reference of someone who took time for you, someone who prayed for you. There are a number of people who prayed for me. There are a number of people I've prayed for. i prayed for literally millions of people all over the world. And, and, and I will continue to so do, as long as the Lord gives me breath. But you don't ever think that you get to a point where you arrive and that you don't need prayer and that you don't need to grow. You always need to grow. And then be careful how you treat people while you're growing. Be careful what you say and how you say it. Just because someone may have uh, stumbled and fell, help them. And, and, and you want to know the way that you know if a person is a shepherd or not? I'm going to tell you how you know. They must smell like sheep. They must have some time of stink on them. In other words, uh, Acts 4, 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took note of them that they had been with Jesus. You've got to be where you're touchable, reachable. You've got to have an ear to hear what people are saying. Hear their heart when they're hurting. Feel their tears when they're crying. Feel their pain. And then just don't be gratuitous. You, you, you've, got to be, you've got to take what we have. As, 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 uh, as uh, Peter and John said at the gate, silver and gold. You know, I don't really have a lot of money. To, and, and believe it or not, sometimes people don't need all your money. They want your time. They want your attention. They want your love. 
And when people know that you love them, what is that you say, Elder Nixon? I like to, I, you, you, you just coined it. People don't care how, how much you know. That's it, until they know how much you care and how true it is. So now Jesus is saying, you ready, preacher? Yes, sir. Jesus is saying um, to them in his dialogue here in Matthew, and this is Matthew's writing. Matthew was a thief, okay? So now while y'all want to criticize everybody else, y'all need to understand that the Bible is full of converted crooks and people who did time, should have did time, should have done time, and God touched them. Yes, sir. So don't point your finger down on anybody. He, he was at the table collecting taxes, and he was skimming off the top. Okay? He was cutting his cut. Here, here's the government. Here's my, here's my cut. Here's the government. Here's my cut. Anybody that you find that's been used by God, sometimes they have a shady past because God had to clean them good and let the blood cover. Let, otherwise, they would have said, I did it. But there's something about our lives. Now, you may not have done anything like that. You, yours may have been on internally. You may have been mean as a junkyard dog. And some of you are. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, some of you look like you may have had rocks for breakfast. You know, you try to speak to you and all the rest of it, you know, whatever is going on. All right. Uh, Bishop Williams used to say, it takes far less muscles to smile than it does to frown. Uh, I think he said seven or nine, I can't remember the number, uh, to smile, and 28 or something like that, to frown. But some people choose to frown rather than to smile. Do you know you look better when you smile? That is so true. You look, you look so much better when you smile. All right, so read the, read, read the book. Read the book. The so some the of y'all need to be smiling all the time. <laughs> some of us. Go ahead. The word of the Lord is coming from Matthew, the sixth chapter, starting right. at the fifth verse. All right. You all can be seated because I'm teaching, uh, I'm teaching, preaching. Go ahead. And when thou prayest, mm -hmm. thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. So you're going to pray. I'm going to teach you how to pray, Jesus says, but I don't want you to be a hypocrite. The word hypocrite is a theatric term that means pretender. So he's saying, and what would happen is they would put on a mask. Uh, in front of their face and pretend to be something or someone that they weren't. And he says that when you pray, I don't want you to be a pretender. I don't want you to be a hypocrite. I don't want you to be a phony. I want you to be real. Keep it real. Read the book. For they love to pray standing in oh, the synagogue. Oh, they want everybody to see them. Here I am in the temple. I am Bishop Daniels. Let me pray. Oh, most holy reverend God who created oh, the heaven and the earth. And uh, 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 knowing that you're watching me. But Peter, when he was drowning in the water, he didn't have time for no long Ooh. prayer. <laughs> Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Sometimes that's what... But it's necessary. Read the book. In the synagogues and in the corners of right. the street. Well, slow down. You, you're talking too fast. I got to get every word. In the synagogues? In the synagogues, those were the places where Jewish people came together, where they read the, uh, the Torah, Genesis to um, Malachi, and also other books, Torah, first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the writing, teaching of Moses, the writing, the words of the prophets, and all the rest of it. They'd go in the synagogue to do that. That's where scribes, scribes are writers, okay? All right, Pharisees are the ones that interpreted the law. Keep, all right, they'd go in the synagogue, keep reading. And in the corners of the streets. And they go on the street corner to be deep, not to be ministering, but to be deep. Go ahead. That they Purpose and intent is what is meant there. Make sure that wherever we go and whatever we do, that our heart is right. And if you are sincere, uh, people can see through it. And if you're not, they can see through that too. Yeah. Go ahead. That they may be seen of men. That they may be seen of men. I explained it, keep reading. Verily I say unto you. All right, truly, definitely, when you see that verily, that's what he's saying. Uh, no question about it. It's not even a second guess about it. Go ahead. They have their reward. That's what they're going to get. They got their reward. Oh, elder so-and-so is deep. Oh, this one is that. Oh, what? That's it. That's as far as it's going. 
Read. But thou, uh -huh. when thou But pray, you, I want you to be different. And that's what the Lord is calling. Let's be different. Let's be righteous. Let's be holy. Let's be true. Let's be unique. Let's be peculiar. Read. When thou prayest. When you pray. And don't let the thou's and y'all's and these and sayest and all of that. Just take the EST off and get the base of it and, and keep on running. Go on. Into into thy closet. Go into a private place. That's what that means, your closet. Read. And when thou hast shut thy door. And put everything and everybody out. So it may be early in the morning, late at night. It may be a break that you have at work. It may be a space that you have where you're to yourself in solitude. All right? Go ahead. Pray to thy father. Pray to the father. Which is in secret. In secret. All right? In other words, you're, you're saying to the Lord and you're talking to God. And you talk to God just like I'm talking to you. He's not deaf. He can hear you. Talk to him. Here's how I feel. Here's what I think. But there's some things you have to do before you talk about yourself. And we'll learn that in just a moment. Keep reading. And thy father which seeth in secret. God is seeing everything that you're doing in secret. He knows. Amen. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves because it looks like we're going through just so much. And we're saying, why this? Why me? And why now? But the Lord knows. He sees. And when someone sees something and they care about you, you have some hope and help. All right? So if, uh, if, if, you, if you care for me, all right, and you see me in trouble, you're going to do something about it. Okay? I don't have to tell you my whole story. If you see it and you know it, you see me falling, you're going to try to catch me. Okay? That's what, that's what Scripture is saying. All right? So, Brother Joshua, you see me falling, going down. You don't just let me fall and say, ah, he should have kept his balance. <laughs> you do your best to help me. Read on. Shall reward thee openly. Then the Lord is, and sometimes, <clears throat> people of God, the open blessings that we see that rest upon our lives is because of what we did in private. And... My mother used to tell me, she used to say, Brother Pastor, don't you worry about it. Don't worry about this, that, and other, because all of the devils in hell can't stop God when he gets ready to bless you. It doesn't matter who doesn't like it, who doesn't like you. When God gets ready to bless you, there's nothing that the devil can do about it. Read on. But when you pray. When you pray. That means you need to pray. You need to pray. You need to pray. Amen. You need to pray. Amen. Go on. Use not vain repetitions. Don't be uh, just doing what you're saying for jitter jatter, just constantly that makes no sense, just rambling and saying stuff to make it sound good in your ears and all of the rest of it has no substance, has no meaning, has no purpose, it's not intent, no intent from your heart or your mind. You're just saying words to say words and repeating them over and over again. That's not to say um, when you're not travailing, or when you're laying or laboring before the Lord, that's different. This is about your normal system of praying, all right? So there's nothing wrong with saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's not vain repetition. I don't want you to get that twisted. Uh, vain repetition is just uh, repeating. Repetition is to repeat and vain is when it has no balance, uh, no maturity, no spirituality, and it's carnal. Go ahead. As the heathen do. That's what heathens do. <laughs> and you know what happens after you do that for a little while? You, those rhythms can get to you, and you can start doing it. That's why things like rap and all the rest of that is attracting to young people and other people. Uh, because it has a pattern, it has a repetition, and all of the rest of it. And after a while, if you're not careful, you can listen to some music 
and you may not even know what the words are saying. Uh, I mean, I know y'all may not admit it, but you'll find yourself. Amen. Then you have to come to yourself. Loose here, loose here, loose here, loose here. <laughs> and that's why and how it attracts young people because it's repetition and it's the words and it's the language and in music there's a culture and there's a spirit behind music and the enemy will give 99% truth in music to give 1% lie and that 1% lie can be so damning until it can affect your soul they'll tell you some things that's true and, and in the lyrics it may be true but that's not the intent the devil has one line and that one line is how he wants to captivate your mind. Mm -hmm. And that's why you must guard your mind and watch what you think, watch what you say, watch how you do it. Read on. For they think they, that they shall be heard for their much speaking. They think they're going to be heard because they're doing all this talking. Go on. Be not ye therefore like unto them. Don't be like that. Go on. For your father knoweth what things ye have need he of. He already knows what you have need. And that's why when you enter into the chamber of worship and praise and adoration, and when you bless God, sometimes you don't even know what to say in your prayer. But the Spirit maketh intercession. And, the, and you get to a point where you let the Spirit take over your prayer. And you, sometimes you must be still. And, 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 and those that have been in the church, sometimes you would hear they're not saying words, they just may be, oh, Jesus, hallelujah, glory, 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 glory. Lord, I love you. Mm, mm. Thank you. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. All right? You set in tone. You set, you set in a, a stage for the presence of God. And it, it, it gives an atmosphere. So every time when you're even in prayer, you don't have to be saying a word. So if it's a one-hour prayer, you don't have to figure out, Lord, what am I going to pray for an hour? You get on your knees and you don't know what to say. Oh, I don't know how to pray. All right? read, read the word back. Go to the Psalms. Give God his word back. You said you're a very present help in trouble. God, you said, you said. Uh, many times I tell the new members and, and, and people that I minister to in prison and all the rest and other places, hospital, just give God his word back. Lord, you said that you. Now, the only way you can tell God what he said is to learn what he said. So you can bring it back to your members. Read on. Before you ask him, mm -hmm. after this manner. All right, so now Jesus says, I'm going to give you a model. After saying all that, I'm not going to leave you out there by yourself. I'm going to give you a model. Uh, growing up, uh, there used to be, we used to buy kit cars. They were in boxes. None of it was put together. Or we used to buy puzzles, depending on what it is you used to do. And what would happen is, is you would take the pieces and you would read the instruction. You would read the instruction you would read the instruction and it would help you to put the pieces together. Whenever you try to do it without reading the instructions and you've never done it before, you're going to mess up. All right? You, you, you're going to put it backwards. You're going to put it in places it doesn't belong. All right? And there's a pattern to what God wants to do. God wants you to get the big picture, the whole picture, the complete picture. But in order to do it, you, it's piece by piece. And sometimes in our life, God reveals things piece by piece. God, why is this going on in my body? Piece by piece. God, why is this going on in my finance and my mind? Piece by piece. He's working it out. For we know what? That all things work together for what? The good to them that love the Lord and to them that are the called according to to his purpose. Read on. I've there, got to get ready to sign off. Therefore pray ye. All right. Our Father. So when you pray, here's the model. The first thing you do before you say, Lord, I need a new car. Lord, I need a new house. Lord, I need to pay this bill. Lord, I need to do this. When you pray, 
do what? Go back. Our Father. Our Father. Notice, notice there, notice there the language our Father. Not right there, just my Father, but our Father. Amen. Inclusive, okay? I want you to see that. Our Father. All right, and so that we don't get mistaken because a lot of people and a lot of things and a lot of groups call themselves Father. Go ahead. Which art in heaven. He lives in heaven that resides in heaven. That's the one we want to go to. We want to go to that Father. We don't want to go to Big Daddy or nobody else. We want to go to our Father. Go ahead. Hallowed be thy name. Your name is holy. Your name is sacred. Your name is precious. Our Father resides in heaven, holy is your name. Yeah. Read on. Thy kingdom come. I want your kingdom. And the kingdom of God is spiritual. It's not meat or drink, but it's joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. That's what the Bible says. So the kingdom of God, and that means we are children of the kingdom of God. All of us are part of the kingdom, and we bow to the king. <clears throat> not to our own will, not to our own thought, not to our own imagination. We yield and surrender ourselves as servants to the most high God that abides in heaven. Yeah. Read on. Thy will be done. I want your will, the things that you want to occur in my life, in the world, in the universe. And sometimes God will have you pray for the universe. He'll have you pray for people you don't know. You all, most of you here don't know people in Ukraine or Russia or Africa or Spain or whatever, but God has a will for the world, Brazil. And you pray that his will would be done in the earth, everywhere. And sometimes what you don't realize, the reason you made it through that thing is because somebody prayed for you. Somebody you don't even know. And Bishop Mason used to say, Lord, bless the saints everywhere. All right? So when you pray, make your prayer inclusive, just not your four and no more. God bless them. And whenever the Lord lays somebody on your heart, pray for them. I don't believe that I run into people by accident. I don't believe that. I don't believe that any person that I ever come in contact with is by accident. I believe it is by the plan and the will of God. And I don't know whether I'm the one to plant whether I'm the one to sow or whether I'm the one to affirm. But if somebody crosses your path, comes your way, you have a godly responsibility to make sure that you, in that space, that moment that you have, that you edify God and you edify a believer so that when they're not around you, they will indeed say, as did the disciples with Jesus on their Emmaus road, did not our hearts burn. The words they said were different. They used to say to Mother Daniels all the time, and I know I'm out of time. They used to say to my mom all the time, uh, Mother Daniels, what kind of makeup is that you're wearing? She said, baby, it's called salvation and glory. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I just absolutely loved my mother. I just love her still. Uh, in other words, she didn't wear natural makeup, but the glory of the Lord. And I'm not saying to you that you can't. I'm not, not, that's not what, don't get it twisted. I'm not going down that road. I'm saying that there is a glow. Ask Moses, when he had come from being with Jesus, the Shekinah glory of God would had rested upon him. And when you looked upon him, there was a glow. Sometimes you can be around people and they bring out brilliance. You just like being around them. You can't understand why you like being around them. My mother said to me, and I know I'm making a lot of reverence to Mother Daniels, but that's okay too. She said, she said, Brother Pastor, you are a magnet person. And she said, because of, that means people are attracted to you, people that you don't know and all the rest of it. So you have to be careful uh, because a magnet attracts all kind of people. And so just make sure that your light so shine that they can see God in whatever you do and whatever you say. Read on. In earth as it is in heaven, mm -hmm. give us this day. Lord, I need to survive today. 
Stop praying for what you're going to do 10 years from now. Day by day, Lord, help me. Give me victory today. Give me peace today. Give me joy today. Give me power today. Let me be an overcomer today. So God, in order for me to do it, you must give it to me. Because all my help, all my strength comes from you. Give me the day. And if you give me the day, it'll be sufficient, my daily bread. Read on. Our daily bread. All right, I went ahead of you. <laughs> and forgive us our debts. And then forgive. And I got to close with this because I'm out of time. Forgive. Forgive. Oh, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they said. They meant to do this. They tried to destroy me. I worked so hard. I gave my best years to this job, to this family, to this church, to this community. Forgive. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Free yourself. And then whom the Lord has set free is free indeed. And the way you get to that freedom is by declaring your freedom. I refuse to let this bond. I tell them that are around me, I let it die for the lack of attention. Some things you don't even need to respond to. You need to just leave it alone and let it be where it is. Oh, they said, okay, who? Cool. Hallelujah. Now, that's not always easy. So that's why I'm getting ready to pray. Because your emotions and your feeling of being used and abused now, I know the song say, after you've done all you can, just stand. What do you do when you don't feel like standing? What do you do when you feel like fighting? And you go to the song, we are soldiers in the army of the Lord. We got to fight. Okay. Let it go. My sister-in-law in her lifetime, Rosalind, and I, when we would talk to each other, my brother's wife, Rosalind, we'd always say to each other, she'd say, I would say to her, Raj, she said, yes, sir. let's let it go. She said, well, this, that, and other, this, that, and other, said, let's let it go. I would say to her, I said, Raj, you just don't get it. It doesn't matter whether I get it or not. Let it go. And then we move on to something else because we made up in our mind. And if you're going to be a good prayer partner for somebody, the first thing you can do with them is not to justify their upset, where they're upset, but help them to let it go. Because, you know, you can agitate the situation and make it worse. No, that wasn't right what he said. No, that wasn't right the way she did you. Oh, yeah, they better be glad. You know, they better be glad. Um, uh, like, like, uh. Uh, and I'll close with this. Uh, I was out to buy my bishop, uh, Bishop Flakes, a car. And uh, his car was just breaking down on him. And he had asked all the pastors in the jurisdiction, they had asked him, uh, Mother Scott and some of the others, Mother Daniels and some of the others, had asked all the brethren, why don't you all go in together and get Bishop a car? He said he's 80-something years old. It's winter. It's cold. Uh, his car is breaking down. He and mother in their car. Anything can happen to them. They're older people. One of the pastors said, "If he uh, said uh, uh, he a man like we are, we go get our own stuff. Let him go get his own stuff." And uh, so I stood up in that particular elders council and defended him. 
I said, brothers, let's, let's do whatever we can. Then, then they start shouting at me. You want them to have a car so bad, you go buy it. I didn't say anything. I, I held my peace. Bishop Flakes was a wise man. I did not say that I was going to buy him a car. They told me, if you want him to have one, you go buy it. So I had an appointment with Bishop Williams the next morning, and we were to go to breakfast, and we were to take care of some matters. And... Um, Early in the morning, normally Bishop Flakes didn't get up before 10 o'clock. He and Mother Flakes. But this particular morning after that rough elders council, Bishop Flakes called me about 7, 8 o'clock. Brother Daniel? Yes, sir, Bishop. What time are we going to get my car? <laughs> I said, I said, well, Bishop, I said, Bishop, I can't, I can't go with you. Uh, right now, I said, because I had promised uh, my godfather, Bishop Williams, we were going to go get breakfast. And um, who is your bishop? I said, I said, Bishop, you are. Well, you call Bishop Williams and you tell Bishop Williams, I said, that you're going with me and you can take him to lunch. I said, I said, yes, sir, Bishop. I got off the phone with Bishop Flakes and I called Bishop. Williams. And I said, Bishop Williams, how you doing, Dad? Oh, son, 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 I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Looking forward to going to breakfast with you this morning. <laughs> oh, wow. I said, well, Bishop, uh, can we go to lunch? Uh, he said, well, what, what's wrong? What's wrong? I said, um, Bishop Flakes uh, want me to take him to go help him look at a car. And he told me I could take you to lunch. He told me, who is this bishop? Oh, and I told him he was. He said, you call Bishop Flakes back, and you tell him that I said we already had an appointment, and if anybody going to lunch, take him to lunch. <laughs> I, said, I said, yes, sir, Bishop. So I called Bishop Flakes back. I told Bishop Flakes, I said, Bishop Flakes? Yes, sir. Did you talk to Bishop Wynn? I said, yes, sir. Uh, what did he say? I said, well, listen, Bishop, I'll be there at 9 o'clock to take you to breakfast. I, I mean, to go to the dealership. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right, son. Thank you so much. Oh, I love you. I, oh, you know, oh, God bless you. All right. okay. I called Bishop Williams back. I said, Bishop Williams? Yes, son, 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 son. I said, I'll be there at 9 o'clock to pick you up for breakfast. <laughs> uh, oh, what did Bishop Flake say? Son, oh, yeah, I'll be there at 9 o'clock to get you. So I went. Bishop Flake, Bishop Williams was closer to me, and uh, I had promised him first. So I drove around, picked up Bishop Williams. I got Bishop Williams. I said, Bishop Williams, I said, would it be okay right before we go get breakfast if I just make two stops? Oh, yes, son. Oh, yeah. I'm just, you know, oh, you know, and he was talking to me and inspiring me and encouraging me. Oh, I had him in the front seat. Then I drove over there on Dean Road. I picked up Bishop Flakes. I put, and when Bishop Flakes came out, he just didn't come out by himself. He came out with Mother Flakes. And Mother Flakes had on a big old Sunday morning church hat. <laughs> Getting ready to go look for a car. So all three of them were in the car. And when they were in the car, the whole tone and tenor changed. When both of them saw each other. Now, I knew what they told me. But when they saw each other, Oh, they were so glad to see. Oh, Bishop. Oh, Bishop. Oh. <laughs> they were glad to see each other. They had a wonderful time. We went out. We went to Metropolitan Cadillac. And we went inside. I'm getting to the point of Mother Flakes. That's the point, I, the whole point of this. Went to Metropolitan Cadillac. There was a beige Cadillac on the showroom floor with a ribbon on it. Now, I told Bishop and Mother. I should Well, I, I did tell them, so I have to say I told them. I said, when we go out there, you all just look at the cars. Number one, don't act like you like any of them. That's rule one. And number two, don't tell them that we have a little change. Okay. Mother Flake said, all right, all right, all right. Don't act like I like it. And 
and don't tell them you got some money. I said, don't use the word money. I said, chain, mother. All right. We get to Metropolitan Cadillac. Bishop Williams is with me. He just smiling. And uh, Bishop Flakes and Mother Flakes walk in. Before they could even show them the cars on the car lot that had discounts and, and you know, uh, you know there were <laughs> demonstrators and everything else, uh, um, Bishop Flakes points to the car on the showroom floor with the ribbon on it. He and Mother said, that's the car we want, and we don't want nothing else. And so I said, Mother, all right, y'all go over here and sit down. And so I'm trying to talk to the man, trying to talk the price down, trying to talk the price down, you know. And then Mother Flakes put her hand on her hip backwards like this, <laughs> put her finger out like this. And I'm trying to talk the man down, and she starts shaking that hat and shaking her head because I was asking the man, and the man told me what he wasn't going to do. She said, you better be glad you talking to him because if you had met me before I got saved, it would have been a problem here. <laughs> we laughed about that for years. <laughs> Needless to say, the Lord blessed. And we were able to, I was able to get Bishop that car. He drove off the parking lot uh, with that uh, brand new Cadillac with the ribbon on it. And he was ever, ever, ever so happy. And I promise you, the Lord has blessed me. See, sometimes you don't know how people, how you make it good for yourself. By helping Bishop, made it only good for me. That's how the Lord works. That's how the Lord works. That's how the Lord works. The Lord works. So, uh, forgive. I'll pick this up, Lord willing, unless I pick it up Sunday's message and teach on it. But I really want to probe on forgiveness because there's freedom in forgiveness. And there's peace and forgiveness when you let it go. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for your love. We thank you, Lord, that you're teaching us how to pray. You are in heaven, and hallowed be thy name. Blessed be thy name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the day. Give us the victory. Give us the peace. Give us the power. Give us the love to love one another, to care for one another, to bless one another, to edify one another. You've been so good to us, better to us than we've been to ourselves. So we give to you all glory, all honor, and all praise. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who are viewing our service, I want to encourage you to be an active participant in giving. Please right now take a moment and share your gift. You can share it by the instruments that are on your screen. And please share and aid us at the Holy Redeemer Church as we continue to do the work of the Lord. Uh, many of you can plant a seed of $20 or plant the best gift you can. And I'm going to ask those of you in the sanctuary to please prepare your gift and uh, bless, O oh Lord, every gift and every giver. In Jesus' name, amen. Please, as many as can, bring $20 or as close to it as you can uh, as we bless the Lord with our giving. Thank you. Uh, our deacons are present, and they'll receive it. Please take $20 out of here. It is a joy to see each of you this evening. We pray uh, for all of our sick and shut in, and we pray for the Clark family and their hour of bereavement, uh, their, his, Brother Clark's father services tomorrow um, in Chicago, and we also pray for Brother Titus. His father's funeral is tomorrow as well, and we pray for him, and we pray for all of our sick and shut in, and we remember each other in prayer and in the spirit of love. Uh, again, I want to commend our hospitality, our greeters, our ushers, our ministry workers, each of you, for all what you did uh, during the convocation uh, 2022. And I'm so grateful uh, for your wonderful support uh, that you provided. And I want to encourage you uh, to see you this Sunday. Looking forward. Uh, uh, to uh, ministry and the word from the Lord that the Lord has given to me for you. I want to encourage you also to bring your young people and children 
on Wednesday night so that they can participate in the youth activities and the 6 p.m. prayer that precedes our time, as well as the deacon and elder training that is also at 6.30, um, and the various auxiliary and units that uh, resume. Now, I think they said the Mother's Board uh, meeting is not tomorrow, uh, but uh, in September, is that accurate? Or is it tomorrow? So it's not tomorrow, it's just in September. And so we want to make sure that all of our mothers are engaged and that we unite and we build ministry. We're standing. The peace of God, the presence of God, and the protection of the Lord be with you all. In the wonderful and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. We welcome our visitors, and we thank you so much. We thank the Lord for Sister Tanisha and the clinic. They did an excellent